podcast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, huge, a huge part of it. Uh, I think the great thing for he and I is that um, you know, we see things the same way. Uh, but I think to your point, um, you know, he brings a background of, of running the football that um, you know is really impressive. And um, certainly we know what we need to do to run the football. But I think he's excited about you know the guys that we have. Um, I think some of our guys up front have had really good off season. So excited to see how the, the offensive line develops over these uh, 15 practices. Um, but also, you know, the running backs that we have. Um, and, and all of our quarterbacks are mobile. So I think that, that's significant as well. Uh, but, but it's been great, you know, just early on to, you know, sh- exchange ideas of things that have gone on the last few years for him, things that we've done here. And, you know, as we go, what's going to be right for Ohio State, we'll continue to develop that. Right behind us, Tony Herman, Buckeye Hubble. Ryan asked uh, a month ago about Sonny Styles. He was with the linebackers today. Is that a permanent thing? What, what did that conversation yeah, we want to, um, you know, put guys in position to be the most successful they can, but also embrace it. And, and Sonny, uh, you know, has wanted to, you know, do whatever he can to, to help the team. And uh, we know that his skill set uh, is versatile, and we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, but but you will see him at linebacker. Um, you'll also see some do, do some other things as time goes on. But uh, we think uh, you know he brings a lot to the table there. Um, he can do so many different things and. Um, and I think that's, again, the exciting part year in and year out is you have different, different people in different spots, and then you have to figure out how you want to utilize them the best. Today was just day one, real basic, uh, but he was working at linebacker today, so we'll watch the film and, and continue to build his package. Uh, front row, Dave Biddle, 24-7 sports. Ryan Chip has been your coach when you were a quarterback. He's been your boss. He is your mentor, and now you're his boss. How, how unique is that in your and I, and I think the other part of it is, is, you know, we've been friends and we continue to be friends. And I think that's probably um, the thing that over the years, you know, we're both very, very competitive. Um, you know, I could tell you stories, not right now, about when I played or even when we've coached. Uh, but then, you know, when, when the meeting gets over, we get off the field, we're hugging it out. And there's a lot of love there. Um, I owe um, much of where I am at right now uh, to him. Uh, and so this isn't about you know any of that as opposed to you know um, a couple guys part of a great uh, program right now that are trying to go chase some great goals and um, you know, he's been great uh, you know he's really uh, done a great job already of connecting with a bunch of the, the staff members and coaches but more importantly the players and um, it's going to be fun journey to go on but it's going to be uh, competitive every day and that's one thing that he's always done and something I've always admired about him and and the ability to adapt over time and change, and um, so yeah, already it's been it's been you know fun to come to work every day because you know you're going to get challenged. Um, but even more as you look ahead to you know this spring, this preseason, as we get into the year, you know where where is this team going to be? What's the journey look like? Uh, what's the offense look like? Um, but uh, but so far it's it's been um, you know enjoyable to come in and. You know, be able to step out of the room and know that you know there's a bunch of guys in that room that are grinding on it that are going to get it right. Super quick, is he going to coach from the field or the box? Uh, I don't know if we've talked about that yet. I know he's always been a guy who likes to be down on the field, um, but uh, but we haven't got that far yet. Rob Aller, Columbus Dispatch. Yeah, Ryan, you talked about wanting to sort of step back and play calling, uh, see the bigger picture. Yeah. The guys yesterday were saying you may be stepping back also from the quarterback room. Kind of have this tag as the quarterback whisper. I wasn't whispering today out there. I can tell you that. <laughs> I mean, how have you had to juggle that 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 decision? Because that's kind of what you're known for. That's your strength. That you're kind of backing off that a little bit. That decision, and, and is that how it's going to work? Yeah, I, um, you know, Chip is is coaching the quarterbacks, and then you know, so much of what I learned was from him, and and vice. You know, we we work together in so many different areas, and. And then you know I coach for them, and, and even uh, you know it's with the with the Eagles and with the 49ers and, and with him. You know, there's just a lot of back and forth there, and so there's a lot of conversation. And um, so I'll still be very much uh, involved, but certainly you know Chip is running it. He's going to run the meetings. He's going to do all those types of things. But 
Um, but there's a lot of give and take there as well, a lot of conversation. And, um, but it's it's you know it's a good group of quarterbacks. You know they're um, you know they they they've got really good leadership. They've had a really good off season. I think you know all the feedback we're getting from Mick has been very very positive. Um, you know we, I think we counted up between seven on seven and team reps. I think we had 150 reps today, and that's that's a bunch, and that's great because that's what these guys need. And the more we can spread those around, the better. At Murphy, 24/7 sports. Uh, Brian, with the quarterback situation, you have some veteran guys, yep. uh, but none of them have a ton of experience in games in your offense. How do you divide up spring reps so that you can get them ready for what you hope will be a successful season, but you've also got some of these young guys that still need one? Well, I think, like I mentioned, we're trying to get as many as we can. If we can get 150 a day, that, that's, that's going to you know, be a little bit different maybe when the pads are on. But um, the more we can get, the better, because these guys all need those reps. And then we'll put your body of work together and kind of figure out, you know, probably halfway through the spring where guys are at and can keep going from there. Um, so I think the key is right now we have the ability because of um, mid-years and, and those type of things to have a pretty full roster um, where maybe in the past in the spring, uh, you know, a few years back before we had so many guys at mid-year, the transfer portal was, wasn't where it's at right now. Um, the preseason roster would look a lot different than the spring roster. Now, it's, you know, there's only going to be a few, a handful of guys that actually, um, you know, come in during the summer. So we're able to get three three groups, uh, reps, and equal reps. So again, it all comes down to those reps and making the best of them. Steve, the Phoenix Cleveland dot com. You mentioned last time we talked to you about Josh Fryer potentially playing some guard in the spring. We saw Luke in there today as well. What, what do you like about him on the interior? Well, he's very athletic. He's somebody who, uh, to me, is is very skilled in a lot of areas, uh, making the transition to the offensive line here in the last couple of years. Uh, we think he's got a very, very high ceiling. And, you know, he's got a list of things that just like everybody has that um, he's going to work on uh, this offseason. Um, he, you know, he played tackle last year and, and uh, did some good things. And, and we think he can still play some tackle. But we also really want to look at him at guard. One, because that's sort of an open spot right now. Uh, and then two, we also think with his quickness, he can get on guys quickly and he can bend. And that's very, very important in that position. And so. Uh, with some of the schemes we're going to be running, we think you know he has the skill set in order to do it. So now he just needs the reps to go, f you know, prove he can do it. Uh, I think we'll come up for air in the spring and figure after spring's over and figure out what kind of progress has been made, evaluate it, and then go from there. Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Row. Brian, I don't know if you've had a team with this much experience on this one spring roster. Right. Uh, you have this kind of situation. I can imagine it's just for you guys to be able to get so many young guys reps because you can kind of set the yeah, like I mentioned before, there, there, there's guys that are different points of their career on the roster right now. And so um, as time goes on, right now we just want to get as many reps as we can and get these guys going. Uh, but, but as time goes on, I think to your point, we have to evaluate some guys. Some guys are, are working on getting things better. You know, let's take a guy like um, you know, JT or Tyleek or you know, Cody Simon. I mean, they have a, a list of things that they're trying to get done uh, purf purposefully this spring. Then there's some guys uh, take you know some of the defensive linemen like uh, you know Jason Moore, Caden McDonald, uh, Will Smith. I mean these guys are trying to you know push to, to get on the field and play. Completely different position. Uh, take a guy like Jeremiah Smith, who's a freshman, who just literally you know got here about a month or two ago, and is learning the offense for the first time. Um, you know then you have guys uh, like you know Quinshawn or Will who have played football before, but now they're learning our offense. So all different guys in different points of their career. Um, so we want to get as many reps as we can, but knowing that, um, like you said, there's certain guys that have played a bunch of football here, and you know the idea for them isn't to just get as many reps as we can. The idea for them is to be pointed in what we're trying to get done with them as, as the spring goes on. Austin Ward, uh, the Bobcat. Brian, you've always talked about the quarterback position battles carrying over to practice 16 in August. With the, every, the way everything is changing in college football, yeah. is there any part of you that feels like there has to be more urgency or that it can't work that way anymore? Yeah, I, do, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think we'll get a feel for how it all shakes out at the end of the spring. But to your point, um, it is different because of the, 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 the portal you know, window opening. Um, and, and we do have you know, a bunch of guys in that room. So um, yeah, we're hoping to see some delineation as the spring goes on. Dan Holt, Love Warriors. Brian, obviously, you know, 
and Chip, a lot of his background is, you know, coaching offensive linemen. What made you confident he could be the guy to coach the quarterbacks this year? Oh, um, I mean, he's he's coached it all for so long, and you know, he was my quarterback coach, and, and um, you know, even um, you know, back in the NFL, I mean, he had a huge hand in a lot of the quarterback meetings. He would sit in the meetings, um, you know, and I think even back, you know, when I played, you know, he coached all kinds of different positions, and I think that's what gave him. Um, you know, the, the, the point of view of seeing it from all 22. Uh, I think sometimes guys, you know, they get caught up in one position and, um, you know, they can kind of get a little bit narrow-minded. He sees it all, has seen it all for a long time, um, has a great feel for it. And, you know, you want to be, when you're the play caller, you want to be lockstep with the quarterback. Because there's just certain things that, you know, when you're calling a play, we went over that in the meeting, and I'm calling this play for this reason. And when the, when the quarterback understands this is why it's being called for these types of reasons, it's already been covered in the meeting. And if you're in those meetings, then you have intimate details on what exactly is being said. It allows you to call the game with more confidence, making sure that both guys are on the same page, because those are the, the two guys that have to be on the same page. Yeah. Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Brian, Chip's teams at Oregon, at the time Kyle Schwab probably played at some of the fastest pace. Um, maybe the UCLA teams weren't quite that fast, but still, over time, and just played sort of that up tempo style. Does, does that background change anything, what you guys want to do, either practicing down the road, sort of thing? Well, tempo is always going to be a part of what we do. Uh, it has changed. Some of the rules have changed. But I think more significantly just about, you know, what Chip's done on offense over the years is, you know, at that time it was innovative to be fast. That was kind of new. And, and so I think he's always been innovative on how he's done things and put his players in the best situation to be successful. And so what does that look like right now in college football in 2024? That's, that's the journey that we're on right now. Um, will tempo be a part of it? Yes. Will we go fast every single play? No. Uh, will we huddle every play? Probably not. But maybe. I mean, that's that's part of it. But I think all the different ways that we're going to attack defenses uh, is going to be exciting, but also mixing in the tempos, the personnel groupings. Um, every team is a little bit different. And so uh, it's not cookie cutter. But I think the point is that he's always been innovative in everything he's done. And if we continue to be that way this year, then we'll have a chance to reach our goals. Coach, how do you see Will Howard and the other new faces continue to integrate themselves into the quarterback room? Well, I think you don't just walk into Ohio State. I've said this before, and just you know think you're going to go become the starting quarterback. It doesn't work that way. There's just too much pride here. What Mick Moradi and our strength staff does here in the off season, there's just a lot that comes with it. You don't just show up in the weight room and then go home. I mean, there's a lot of accountability that happens, and our guys take a lot of pride in that. And so there's only one way to do that, and that's to earn it through respect. Um, but you know, we had our champions meeting yesterday in the first quarter, and we had a bunch of newcomers, you know, uh, grayed out as gold, and and that's a big deal, and that's how you earn the respect of the guys around you. Uh, but that's going to be like that for the freshmen as well. You know, the guys who are coming in and um, you know should still be seniors in, in high school are here trying to trying to do that. Now they're younger, and they don't have as much experience as maybe some of the older guys like Will and uh, you know Quinchon or Caleb Downs, but. Uh, but they still have to earn the respect of the team just as just, just as much, and that starts, you know, in the in the, the weight room. But ultimately, it's going to matter when we get on the field. Cameron Keith Robinson, the Athletic. Brian, you last spring you wanted to kind of roam around a little more like a CEO type, or just kind of team with another team. Is the feeling of this practice was it any different for you knowing you had a chip and a guy who kind of wholeheartedly trust everything? Yeah, there's there's no question, and, and maybe it isn't exactly where I'm walking around on the field, but where. Or, you know, I'm able to, you know, look where my eyes are going, you know, just thinking ahead of, you know, the message that maybe I want to give the team or, or maybe grabbing a guy on defense and giving a message to him. It just allows me to be more present with the whole operation, um, which is something I recognize that I need to do. Doug Lake-Reese, Kings of the North. Just a logistical question. With all these reps you're getting quarterbacks, are you viewing Will <coughs> and Devin as the two most veteran guys? Do you want what they get to be equal? With the ones or with the twos, or is somebody getting more with the ones? I think, at least in the first quarter of the spring, I mean, we're just going to let them go play and just get a bunch of reps and roll them. I think, as as that starts to settle a little bit, we'll start to maybe you know make sure you know guys are, are getting the reps with the ones that need to. But, um, but we're going to let them compete, you know. And, and it's hard for us to say, you know, someone like you know Julian saying or Lincoln or you know Air or whoever, hey, you're going to come in here and compete when you know. 
the first thing they do is take a bunch of reps with the threes. Now we want to roll you, whether the, whatever drill it might be, and so that you're getting reps with everybody so you can show what you do. Um, so we'll compete. I mean, we have the, the fortune of having a little bit of time right now, and then as things shake. I think the, the big focus, and this is something we talked to our staff about, is in the spring we want to develop the individual player. As we get closer to the preseason, now we start to really grab on to you know, the schemes and the team and the chemistry of the group. Now, you still need to understand the schemes in the spring and how you fit into them, but that's something that we want to make sure we're, we're at, you know, developing each individual player right now, and that's the focus more than how does he fit in with the scheme or the chemistry of the offense or defense. And as an extension of that question, Will comes in as a starter from another place. Devin was close last year, right? He was right in that battle. A couple times when he got his chance, he got hurt. He was very emphatic with us yesterday about, like, hey, man, like, I'm – I'm here to compete. Like, what what do you think of where Devin is just in this fight right now? I mean, I was impressed with how we practiced today. He had good demeanor. He had that same, um, you know, uh, conviction out in practice today that, that he shared with you guys the um, past couple days. And so if he keeps building like that, I mean, he's going to have a hell of a spring. Andy Baxter, let him in a row. Uh, Ryan, the Cotton Bowl, you mentioned that Carson Hampton was struggling a little bit in playing that game. How's he doing now? How do you view that center competition this year? Uh, he, he had a really good last couple months. Um, it was excellent with Mick. I think having that year of experience has really helped him. Uh, he's, you know, his numbers in the weight room are very, very good. Um, so, you know, the combination of having a year under his belt and um, having a good off season, you know, allows him a great opportunity to go compete this spring. Um, you know, we'll kind of see what it, what it all looks like here. Um, again, the pads aren't on, so with the offensive line, we won't know anything for a little while. Uh, but we've seen strides for him, and again, improvement marked with, you know, or combined with the fact that he played last year a bunch, and we won a bunch of games with him in there, uh, that matters. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fired up to see what he looks like here as we head into the middle of spring. Dylan Davis, no one represents. Nothing about the development of the individual with the quarterbacks. Uh, for Julian and Air, like, I guess, uh, is there anything in particular that you're looking for for them to like, maximize their spring if they come away saying they did this or got better at that? Yeah, 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 but but you're right. I mean, they're learning what to do. That's the first level. Like we talked about this before. The first level is what to do, then how to do it, then why you're doing it, and and you know what is you know the first thing right now. That being said, make great decisions, be confident, take care of the football is going to be the, the things that they got to do. Uh, compete your tail off, trust it, but they also have to put in a little extra work because they don't know. So you know, when you walk on the field, can you take a meeting to the field, or do you need three or four reps? in order to say, okay, now I got it, as opposed to the real good ones. It's one mistake, I learn from it, I move on, and I continue to build fast. If we can see those type of trends, then we'll have some. Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Yeah, I was his first day, but I was just curious your very first impressions of the new guys, of Will, on the, seeing them on the field, Will and Caleb Downs and Quinshaw, Seth Walker, even Jeremy Smith. Jeremiah Smith. Yeah, I think all flashed. Um, I mean, you noticed them. When it's going that fast, or we're getting that many reps, it's hard to really focus on one guy. But um, you know, they all flashed at times, and so we'll get on the film and kind of look. But uh, you can see the talent in all those guys. Nathan Barrett, Cleveland.com. He made it pretty clear that Chip's coming here to run your offense. I think he said you know, a similar thing: the Ohio State offense. At the same time, I know this is a more developmental time, but how much are you guys talking scheme and, and talk yet? And how excited are you to see sort of his brain, his, your offense running through his brain? Well, I think the thing is, you know, in terms of terminology, I think it was important to keep a lot of the terminology because our guys already knew it. So in day one of spring, you know, there was there was a, a quick, you know, uh, learning curve on some of it. Uh, now, that being said, what we've done here has been a lot of what I learned from him when I was with him before. So this is not like, you know, two different, you know, um, you know offenses trying to come together. Uh, what we've done here, there's been a lot of great things. What he's done has been, um, you know, by the way, again, a lot of what we've done is what you know I, I took when when I came from you know the NFL from him, and you know when I played for him. So there's just so many things in common, and a lot of times we'll be in meetings, and you know he'll kind of look at me and say, you know, is is it this play? Yes, it's just another another word for it. So the terminology we tried to keep somewhat intact. Uh, he's made some tweaks already to the run game that I think have been excellent, um, and will continue to be that way. Uh, but but it is important, I think, as I've, I've thought about this, to make sure that you know we are keeping it the Ohio State offense. This is not you know my offense or his offense or somebody else's offense. This is the Ohio State offense um, because we want it to be sustainable. We don't want um, you know someone to come in or come out and then all of a sudden has to change. And I think that's been important to make make sure that that um, you know continues now through in the, into the future.
Whitney Hardy of WCMH. Brian, um, lots of new faces today, and having Chip now here with you, just kind of a softball question here. Was it fun out there today? There's so much pressure we always talk about here. Right. Was there any different level of fun today versus maybe the last couple of years? I think being around a group of guys that enjoy being at work uh, every day like they are is fun. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, and it has to do with you know the staff, but it really comes down to the players. These guys bring energy every day. Uh, they enjoy being out there. They're as close to NFL players and pro players as I've been around. They're very, very competitive. Uh, they can't wait to get the pads on. But it's fun to be around guys like that. And you have to bring it every day as a coach here. You know, when you walk in front of these guys or you have a meeting in front of these guys, you better be prepared because they they have a high level of expectation that we're going to coach at a high level, and we're all holding each other accountable right now. And so, yeah, that is fun as a coach. Brought the team together before the practice started, and laid out some things. But was there ever a moment today when you were roaming around and maybe ranking sometimes at things where you just kind of like looked at there's Caleb Downs, there's Jeremiah Smith, there's all these returnees, there's a quarterback room where you kind of went, damn. I mean, this this is a pretty good assemblage of talent, and you kind of like swallow hard there too, like you know. <laughs> yeah, I we're expecting a lot about this. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. I think. Um, it, during our workouts and uh, mat drills or seeing some of the team runs is kind of when um, you think about those type of things. You, you, know, you look at the guys and you see the potential and it gets you really excited. But then as much talent as we have, it's going to be the no talent issues that actually help us win our, and reach our goals. So that's been the focus now. And so once we get on the field, it's, you know, that's what you focus on. You know, it isn't seeing Jeremiah run a goal ball. Like, that's great. But like, it's, you know, it's the discipline of knowing what to do. It's the focus. It's run into the ball, it's effort, it's energy, it's all the things that, again, take no talent. And so um, that's going to be the focus. Uh, it's not about the talent anymore. That was, a, that was about the last couple months. Now we need to acquire the skill and discipline it's going to take to go reach our goals, and that's what spring's all about. Can I ask one quick follow-up? Of course. Uh, has Chip embraced this role of working under you? I mean, how, how have you noticed his approach? I, I just... Again, he and I've always had a relationship. I just it was never really like that. Even you know, when I played for him or, or worked under him, um, you know, we worked together. And um, I don't I don't look at it like he works for me. I, he works with me, and that's just the way I've always been. Because I love him and have for a long time. And I don't think he looks at it that way either. And so we all we both want to reach a goal, just like everybody else. We're uh, fortunate to be around such a great program. You know, that has unbelievable tradition, but in a place where you know we have what's in place to go reach our goals next year. And I think that's what fires us both up, but just everybody else on the staff as well. We do have one last question. Bill Landis, uh, Kings of the North. Yeah, just curious, is there anybody that you know is not available for spring ball? Yeah, we do have some guys that aren't available. I don't know, Jared, if we talked about that. Um, you want to go through a couple of those guys that won't be available this spring? Guys that, that won't uh, be practicing out there this spring will be uh, Malik Hartford, Peyton Pierce, Miles Walker, It's fair to say that um, we would expect all those guys back in the preseason, though. So, uh, but they just won't be participating this spring. Everybody else, there will be a couple guys maybe that are limited, but uh, but everybody else will be able to go. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate you guys. Pardon me. Yeah. Uh, Chip, uh, first of all, welcome to Columbus. How how is the move in for you? But uh, as far as the decision that you made in the last yeah. couple months, like what went into that thought? I mean, not a lot of guys make the step you made. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I I do a lot of things other people don't do. So I don't know if that's right or wrong, but um, I think it started when we were preparing for our bowl game. Uh, Ryan Gunnerson, who's a great quarterback coach, uh, left to go to Oregon State as the coordinator. 
so he wasn't there. So I actually coached quarterbacks during uh, the bowl game. And I just started to think, like, I hadn't actually coached a position since 2008. And then I think my wife remarked, she's like, I haven't seen you this happy in a long time. And to me, the best part of football is football. And so you got to do football and, and not do some of the things that involved with the head coaching deal. And, and I had a chance after the we beat Boise in the bowl game and as we started recruiting just to kind of think about what that experience was like. And then I get to make the decision on what my future is going to be. And so what do I want to do? So um, I started to look into is there an opportunity and it would have been the right spot um, to go somewhere and, and just coach a position again and be back with that group. Because I think as a head coach, um, you sit in on position meetings, um, but then you're always getting pulled out. And there's, all, there's other things that are involved with, uh, with being a head coach. And I think it's more of a CEO operation right now. You know, it's the, the job and the landscape, as we all know, of college football has changed. Um, so I just thought at the time that, you know, there's a story about John Lennon when he was a little kid that had an assignment of what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be happy. And then his teacher said, I don't think you understand the assignment. And his mom said, I don't think you understand life. So I just want to be happy. And I'm really happy coaching a position. Really happy to be at this place. You know, it's, it would have taken a special place for me to leave UCLA because I love those players and I love that coaching staff. But to be here with Ryan, I had a great relationship. I've known Ryan since he was a little kid. So I think a lot of things just fell into place that way. Coach, uh, third row left, Andy Andrews, left Warrior. Uh, just driving into spring ball here, oh, where do you see, obviously, you know, you're running game background. Where, where do you see this offensive line at, and, and how can you kind of simplify things to maybe help bolster their play? In I, I've been, I was impressed just since I've been here in the last couple of weeks with their athleticism, their attention to detail, and, and their development as players. Um, but to stay on day one, that I, I think that our scheme is going to be this, this, or this. It's you know That's going to be a work in progress as we start to get familiar with what the player's skill sets are and then what we can do. And it's always a combination of what you have up front and then what you have up back. And I know we've got a couple of really talented running backs behind them. So you know it's something that we're going to look at. But I, I also know you can't be one-dimensional in football. You need to be able to throw the ball as much as run the ball. You know It's funny. Some people think I'm an air raid guy. Some people think I'm a wing T guy. Some people think I want to run the ball every down. Um, you know, we're going to we're gonna do what's best for Ohio State, and that's that's kind of what our game plan is right now. Front row right, Austin Ward, podcast. Jim, can you think about um, your first evaluations of the quarterbacks and going through these 15 practices? How do you want to structure that? I know that you and Ryan have probably talked about that a good amount. Like, what's the right way to set up a spring position battle? Mm -hmm. How many reps does everybody need? What's sort of your plan, just to, from a general perspective, I guess? Yeah, you know, we're really detailed in what practice looks like. Um, and how that's going to operate. But I also think you need to let the players go. You know, So I don't think you need to, to put shackles on them, so to speak, and just keep them constrained. I think you got to let them go and you got to let them operate. And we were rotating, I think, everybody on every two snaps today, Just and that was just what we are going to do on day one. You know, We'll reassess it after we got through it, get a chance to count up all the reps of how many, play, how many plays each guy got, and did they get more in seven on than they did in 11 on. You know, and we'll go through that whole thing, and that will be a – a constant flow in terms of how we're doing it. But I, I think the best way people learn is they learn by doing. You know, So they've been great in the meeting rooms. Um, they're sharp when you get them on the board. Uh, they're really good when they're watching film. But you got to go out and you got to play the game. And so the more that we can put them in those situations to play the game, the better we'll have an opportunity to evaluate them. Third row right, Tony Gerfman, Buckeye Huddle. Uh, Jim, just thinking about all of these things, uh, go back so far with Ryan Day, you mentioned that you've known him since he was a kid. What were your first impressions back then? And then as you come full circle to now, like how do you how do you feel about that? It's still the same way. He you know, even since he was playing Little League, he was the ultimate competitor. You know, he was always trying to find a way to win. Um, he was great at a lot of sports, baseball, basketball, football. Um, you know, I got an opportunity to recruit him, you know, so I coached him when I was at New Hampshire. I recruited him out of high school. We all, and we grew up really <coughs> close to each other, so the same elementary school, same high school. Same junior high, same college, you know. So I've known him since for for a really long time. But that competitive fire burns deep with him, and that's the one thing that I've always admired with him. And he's got an amazing athletic brain in terms of how to process things and how to how to put people in position to make plays. He's always been that prototypical coach on the field, no matter what sport he was playing. So um, I knew he was destined to be a coach, you know. And I was fortunate in my career as a head coach to have him on my staff in a couple of places. So I got a chance to see him work firsthand. You know, I got to see him work firsthand as a player and then as a coach. So um, the success he had is not is not surprising to me. What kind of pride there is, is, is there 
where are you seeing Ryan, the success he's had? Yeah, I, I think we all do that. I think we come from a unique place in, in a really small hometown in New Hampshire where um, we all take a lot of pride of where we're from. And, and when anybody's successful coming out of there, then you, you kind of take a little pride that that's, it's the upbringing that we all had, you know, in the youth sports program that we grew up in, in, in every aspect, whether it was football, baseball, basketball. Um, those coaches were had an amazing impact on us, and that's why we are where we are right now. Uh, Further off, Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Sure. Hi, Bill. Um, Ryan said he doesn't think of it as you working under him, as working with him. Mm -hmm. The fact is, he's the head coach. He, really he makes me call him sir. Though. <laughs> 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 I, I he just said, "Can you do that day one?" And I was like, "All right, Ryan." <laughs> no. But I mean, he ultimately is the, is the decision maker. You've yeah. been a head coach. Um, how do you think that's going to work? Do you think there'll be any, as close as you are, any kind of you know, awkward moments is the right term? But I mean, he's the ultimate decider, and you are working for him. Yeah, I, I certainly understand my role. I'm not Al Haig. Like, I'm not, I'm not in charge here. Yeah, yeah. Some people get that reference. Other people don't get that reference. But I, I certainly understand it. And, and I actually kind of relish it because I, I really love the scheming part. I love the individual part. I love being in the meeting room with the quarterbacks uh, and trying to game plan. But everything we do here is collaborative. You know, the one thing that, that really struck me when I walked in this place is there's an amazing coaching staff here. You know, and if you get a chance to talk to Larry Johnson just about football or Tim Walton or Jim Knowles, or Brian Hartline, or any of these guys that are on the staff here. It's it's a very collaborative effort. Um, I think everybody's on the same page. You know, it's not our offense and their defense and all those other ways. It's it's Ohio State. You know, it's it's Ohio State versus the 12 opponents that we're going to play during the regular season, and then beyond. So it's it's really collaborative, and that's the thing I like. Just in the short time that I've been here, is how collaborative everybody's been. You know, we're all trying to make each other better, and we're all trying to develop this team. Well, you touched on this uh, recent. You know, My sense is you, in your perfect world, you'd like to scribble plays on a napkin and not deal with boosters, not deal with all the stuff that coaches, head coaches, have to deal with now. How much of a factor was that in this decision? You could just do football. No, that, that's not it. I mean, I, I enjoy, I mean, we've had some amazing, I've had an opportunity everywhere I've been to meet some amazing people that are associated with the program. And, and there's people that from my time at New Hampshire or my time at Oregon, um, I was just with Phil Knight two weeks ago. You know, I got an opportunity to spend some time with him and his wife, Penny, um, who are dear friends of mine that, that have been great mentors to me in my career. And there was a bunch of people at, at uh, UCLA, Terry Donahue and Andrea Donahue were awesome to me. Angelo Mazzoni is a great friend. Casey Wasserman, Troy Aikman. There was a bunch of people at UCLA that I, I really enjoyed you know, being around and talking with. So um, I think sometimes everybody wants to make a narrative of it's either this or that. It's, it's, it's never that. It's never just all ball. It's never just all recruiting. It's never just all boosters. It's it's a mixture of everything. But I, I think the one thing that, as this position as a head coach kept moving on, is that if you look at a lot of them, they all become more CEOs. You know, I can't tell you how many coaches that have called me since I made this decision that said, I'm two years behind you, brother, you know, that are thinking the same exact way. And I think it's all part of what we have to do. I think we all need to protect this game and promote this game. And I think there are some rules that we need to get um, straightened out so that people understand where, what it's about. Because the game is still about the players. And, I, and I, I hope that never gets discounted. You know, it's, it's always been about the players. And, and um, I think if we can keep that at the forefront, the people that are making decisions on this, and I think Gene Smith is one of the best influences in, in the NCAA, is to make sure we keep that the main thing. The main thing it needs to be the student athletes. Right behind him, Nathan Bear, Cleveland.com. Um, you know, you're coming in at a time where uh, uh, you've been through some places where the expectations are high, I understand. But you're also coming into a, 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 a juncture where Three losses to Michigan, the not making the playoff last year. The urgency is pretty high here. I guess just sort of what perspective do you have on kind of the stakes that there are for Ryan this year and, and um, the decision that then he makes to bring you in to kind of help solve that? Yeah, I, I think the expectations can be no higher than they are in your own brain. You know, and I think if you try to worry about what other people are thinking in their brains, you're going to get screwed up a little bit. So, um, you know, I talked earlier, the one thing about Ryan that I know about him and has always been he's the ultimate competitor. So he's got there's nowhere that has higher expectations of Ohio State than Ryan does, nor the rest of us that joined him and are part of this and that are working with him. So, um, you know, I, I don't think I think sometimes you can spend too much time thinking about those things. You know, what you really have to do is just as the, there's a big sign as you walk into this place that says win the moment. You know, I think that's a real thing that we have to do as coaches is to make sure that our players 
aren't worried about what's going on in the future or, or aren't worried about what's going on in the past or worried about can they get a little bit better today, you know, and can we make improvement. And I think the one thing that I've seen here, and I've only been here for three weeks, but there's a consistency to the players' approach when they walk in this building every day, which is, it's unique. It's not like that everywhere else. And it's one of the things that I remarked to Mick when I, you know, he said, hey, what do you think? And I was like, it's impressive. It's impressive, the culture of the players that are in this program right now. But I think it speaks a lot to the leadership. There's a, there's a lot of older players on this team, um, and they've set the tone for the younger players. And I think the younger players have done a great job of fellowship and getting right in line with that. You've never handed over play calling to someone before. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it mean to you? I guess he technically did it to Bill when he was here for a couple mm-hmm. weeks. But what does that mean to you to kind of be getting that responsibility from him? Um, and he's calling essentially the offense that you gave him, I guess. Yeah, I still think the play calling part will be a collaborative effort. And by that, I mean that if it's a good play, I called it. And if it's a bad play, he called it. Because <laughs> the great part is an assistant coach, you can just you can point the finger a little bit and just say, hey, you know, I, I wanted to do this, but he trumped me. So um, we haven't actually discussed game day yet. You know, we'll see how that operates. But it, everywhere I've been, it's been a collaborative effort. And, and all of a sudden, someone that's calling the plays isn't isn't like, pulls one out of left field that you hadn't practiced and hadn't been part of your offense and said, hey, let's do this. You know, we're not running the annexation of Puerto Rico. You know, we're not coming up with something special, you know, in the middle of the fourth quarter that we haven't done. Um, but I think it's the, the, the key to really being successful in offense is, is how you game plan, how you put it all together, and then how you practice and train for that so that you get a chance to execute it. Because the player's confidence comes, becomes, comes from their demonstrated ability that they've done this so many times in practice that when they get out on the field, that this is like that to them, you know. It's not that they, they do it till they do it right. It's that they practice it so much so that they can't do it wrong. So, you know, I think it's that whole part of it that is really the, the key to being a really good game planning team. Uh, second row right, uh, Doug Lane-Marie, Kings of the North. Chip, when you had that feeling when you were coaching the quarterbacks during bowl yeah. preparation, did you consider at that point maybe resigning as the head coach and thinking like this is, this is not where I am anymore, I'll leave and then I'll – Look to see what else is out there. No, I never thought about quitting anything. So, you know, I just—is there an opportunity that I think I can that fit? You know, and I think that's the. You know, it's no different than when you're talking to a recruit about them making a decision on where they're going to go to school. I think that where they should go to school is where the best fit is for them. So, you know, I just entertained some opportunities, and I always felt I felt like this was the best fit. But I, I never thought about quitting or not coaching. I, I'm going to coach. I'm going to coach and then I'm going to die. I mean, that's how I think I, I think about things is um, I can't picture that. I know someone, I was on the Nike trip and they asked, like, how much longer are you going to go? And I said, I, I have to go another 15, 20 years. And I don't think about, I don't think about retirement. I don't think about any of those things. That's just not kind of my mindset that, you know, I love football. And, and the, as long as I can be part of this game, then I'll be part of this game. And do you have just the, the way things worked out with your departure from UCLA, is there anything that, you wish you had done differently or anything you regret or just the, the circumstances that presented themselves, do you think that you handled that departure the best that you could have? Yeah, I mean, I got an opportunity to tell my players personally. You know, I think in this day and age of the Internet where they read it somewhere else and you have to text message them, you know, that was always important to me that I wanted to make sure I talked to my players and explained the reasons of what I was doing. I wasn't leaving to take a head coaching job somewhere else. I wasn't thinking that the grass is greener at another university. It was just in my personal situation. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to take an opportunity to go be a, a position coach and a coordinator, and that's how it fit. You know, what I was happy is that I always thought to Sean Foster. I think the world of him, and I think he's a special. You know, and the fact that that, that they were they gave him the opportunity to take over there um, was, you know, it worked out. I didn't have any say in that decision. You know, I, w- I was gone, um, but I I always thought that Deshaun would be a great head coach, and I'm really proud of him and happy that that he got the opportunity to take that job. reputation as innovator was part of the appeal of this is that you get to get in the weeds a little bit uh, maybe not mad scientist maybe too too strong of a word because you're working within a system but was there an appeal of I get to get my hands dirty here, here again and innovate and get back to that side of things it was but it was really more important of who I get to work with you know and so knowing um, you know I've got I know a lot of guys on the staff besides Ryan also so you know, when I know what their mindset is and what their values are and how they do things. And so I wanted to be a part of that. But but there's a part of that, yeah. And how much of a teacher, you get, you get labeled an innovator, but teaching's a part.
on this. How much is, is uh, of a teacher are you and how patient are you? Yeah, I think we're all teachers. I mean, education is the transportation of knowledge, you know, so it really doesn't matter what the coach knows. It matters what the players understand, you know, so you have to be able to make sure that while you're implementing things is, is what resonates with them and, and how does that come back to them. So, you know, a lot of our teaching styles that we've learned is more the Socratic method of there's a lot of questions, you know, and a lot of check for understandings just to kind of find out where the players are coming from because it's what they know that that's ultimately going to win games, not what we know. You know, that we're not playing the games. We're not stepping across those white lines. You know, and your job as a coach is to create an environment where they have an opportunity to be successful and then get out of their way and let them go do it. So um, I think the teaching aspect is huge, and we continue to research, you know, some of the latest trends in teaching to to make sure that we are transporting that knowledge to our players. <coughs> Coach, uh, just curious, you got five scholarship quarterbacks with differing levels of experience sure. and age and everything else. Not to annoy him, but just want to ask specifically about Will Howard. Mm -hmm. Coming in after starting part of two years at Kansas State, uh, he just seems to promote this idea that uh, he's a football player, you know, above all else. Just how impressed are you with his makeup? his experience, what he's bringing to the table walking in here right now. Yeah, really impressed. You know, the, you don't have to talk to Will for more than five minutes to kind of know where he's coming from. Um, he's really focused. You know, he knows he's got a short window left in his college career and he really wants to capitalize on what that is. Um, there's a maturity to Will. You know, I, I, I really, I've had experience, my experience in, in this thing since the transfer portal opened in college football is, is some of the best parts I've had an opportunity to coach or transfers. Um, sometimes when you're a, a true freshman and it's five years out, you know, it's like, hey, I got a ton of time. You know, and sometimes when you're a transfer, is that I've got nine months. You know, so there's a sense of urgency, I think, when you're dealing with, with transfers. And I think Will has exuded that since he's been here. But the other thing that I, just in the short time that Will's been here, is how quickly he's fit in with the entire team, you know, and how much the, the rest of the players respect him. You know, he was uh, one of the gold award winners for his work in the weight room in this offseason. So, that says a lot for him coming in here as a, um, in a short time, being able to, to win a weight room award, you know, to start off. Do you guys hope to have a number one internally, externally at the end of spring, or I guess just let it play out? How do you I, I think it always, every time I've been involved in these, I think when they're organic is when it's the best. I, I don't think you can anoint somebody or force the issue because the players know. The players would understand. They see it every single day. Um, you know, and there's a team chemistry part of this thing too, so... Um, we're not going to force the issue, I, I, but I've always seen it play itself out. So I've been fortunate that it, there's always going to be some quarterback battles. At at some point in time, at every school, there's a quarterback battle, you know. And and, and really, you, you got to let them play it out on the field, and that's where it has to that that's where it has to be decided. Coach, time for just a couple more. Far left, Whitney Harding, WCMH. Hey, Coach, welcome, and we're excited to have you here. Oh, thank you. Um, kind of the talk about the innovative part. Ryan said that that's something that he's always loved about working with you, and now he to bring that here and how it would fit with Ohio State. Do you have any idea what that's going to look like yet, or is it just way too early? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I, I think part of it is is you're trying to put the players in position to make plays. So a lot of that comes from getting to understand the players and what their skill sets are and how we feature what their skill sets are. You know, and, and the the one thing after day one, I can tell you that there, there's a lot of skill set out there. You know, so that's what, that's what gets you excited. You know, that's what that's what – you jump out of bed in the morning and you're excited to go to work because of, of the talent that you get to work with. Um, but the one thing that's the most impressive is the work ethic that goes along with that talent. You know, it's not just empty talent. It's, it's you got some kids who want to, I mean, all of them since I've been here want to work. So that, that's what gets you excited. But I think assessing what the skill set is, uh, you know, that we have available to us on the offensive side of the ball um, is, is vitally important. Um, and then our job is to put those guys in positions to make plays. Experience what it's like to coach national championship caliber teams. This program right now is moving into a situation where you got to win mm -hmm. quick and now. So does that feel like pressure here for you, or is it a little bit of excitement, or both? Well, I've always subscribed to as pressure is what you feel when you don't know what you're doing. So if you don't want to feel pressure, then you should know what you're doing. So you know, I think it's it's part of that, and I think part of our job with our players in terms of the education process is getting them to understand that too. Is that you know, it's it's about your preparation. It's about you and your development. It's not about that you can't be governed by what other people say. It's 
it's what's my mindset and how am I intrinsically motivated and how do I really compete against myself on a daily basis to get a little bit better. You know, we got a little bit better today because we got out on the field today and got a chance to do some football. Um, and then the challenge is when we get back on the field on Thursday, um, can we be a little bit better than we were on Tuesday? And if we're doing that, then we keep stacking good days on top of good days, and I think we'll be in a good spot. Hi, Chip, and welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about the pros and cons of coaching from the box and coaching from the field. It's interesting. Talk to some offensive coordinators. Uh, I remember Tom Herman talking about it. He swore he wanted to coach from the box, saw the game so much better, sterile environment, not all the chaos on the field. Mm -hmm. Some coaches you talk to, they're like, I want to be on the field so I can look at my guys in the, yeah. in the eye. Where, where are you at as a, as a coordinator? Honestly, and I've thought of this a lot. I thought of it a lot during COVID because um, we had the empty stands. You know, so I had thought about just walking up into the stands for a little bit because I had a better advantage. I've always believed you can see the game better from up above, but I believe you can feel the game better from the field. Um, so if there was any way we could get a zip wire <laughs> where you could do both, you know, coach call from there, then zip down the field, get a chance to talk to him. Because it's a different deal when you're talking to the quarterbacks on a phone, you know, than being able to look in their eye and kind of see where they are with it. Um, and part of it is the feel part of it. I remember when I coached Ryan once, um, we were playing UConn, and he got hit hard going out of bounds. And he just walked by me, and I was the play caller, and he was like, run the next play. And I just kind of looked at him. I saw the look in his eyes because I don't think he could have thrown it. You know, he was still trying to get his win back. But you wouldn't know that if you're up in the booth. You know, and you call a, a pass play from up in the booth, and you're like, how come he can't complete that? Well, he just got, took a shot going out of bounds. So I, it's that fine line, and I don't have an answer. You know, I think, I think it's feel on the ground, and it's see from up above. Um, Maybe in this day of technology, they'll figure it out. But um, we'll see how that, that, that operates. And whatever Ryan feels is the best for the team is what we're going to do. So. Mark Rowright, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Your, your teams at Oregon were obviously known for playing at this mm -hmm. fast pace and running a bunch of plays per minute. And yep. maybe not act quite as fast as you should, but still, still pretty fast. Yep. Um, what role do you see tempo in having an offense in, in this day yeah. in college football? And has it maybe changed? I think the game is always evolving. You know, I think when I left in 2012 to go to the National Football League, Oregon was the only team that was playing really, really fast and had shiny helmets. And when I came back in 2017, um, everybody had shiny helmets and everybody was playing fast. So I think the game is always going to go up and down. and There's going to be um, different cycles that it goes through. I, I think tempo is part of an offense, but I don't think it's an offense in itself. I think it's more of like if you go to dinner, it's a side order. You know, it's not the main course, but it's, it's always good to have it. Um, so I think there's times when you'll use it, but you're, you're not going to use it extensively um, the entire game. Just like you're not going to throw the ball every single snap in the game. You're not going to run the ball every single snap in the game. You know, there, there's, there's not a game of absolutes anymore. I think the, the ability to be diverse and, and have it as a tool in your toolbox, so to speak, uh, is really how we would look at using it here. Is the fact that defenses are now more familiar with it than... I think so. You know, I think when you first started going tempo, there were people in the NCAA that wanted to outlaw it. They wanted to make an NCAA rule that, yeah, you couldn't do it. You know, and I'll, I'll give Coach Saban credit. I mean, I think, obviously, Nick was the first one to do it. He wanted it outlawed. And then all of a sudden, he adapted it and said, all right, we like this. <laughs> you know, so we'll keep it in. But um, it, it's, I, I think people have, it, it doesn't matter what you do. There's, there's cycles to this game. And then once people catch on to that cycle, then it moves. You know, it's no different than 4-3 defenses and 3-4 defenses. You know, what is the rage when the, when the Giants won the Super Bowl? Um, they were 3-4 they were defense, and everybody, everybody says we have to do that. What people didn't understand is they had Carl Banks and Lawrence Taylor. It didn't matter what defense they were running. I know Jim's back there, and Jim played against them. You know, it was – they could have been a four-down defense, and those guys would have been great players. But it, it's not the scheme. I think the, the coaches that do it the best way is they insert their players um, – and put them in the best position to make plays. And now, now will Temple be part of it? It'll be part of it, but it, it's certainly not going to be the main course. Folks, I'm sorry. Last question, Tim May. Tim May show left for all. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Uh, there, was a, there was a great moment there when y'all were warming up, when you were you were talking with Tim Walton, and Caleb Downs comes up, and yeah. y'all are conversing. And, as you're, and this is kind of a two-part question, but number one, what, what was just your take on the talent you saw on that field today yeah. on both sides of the ball? Where, where would you rank it? Um, you, you know where I'm going. Yeah, I'll, I'll rank it. I'll be very transparent as I was telling Tim and Caleb what a great offensive player I thought Caleb would be, yeah. Yeah. could be, yeah. and should be, <laughs> but I'm not the head coach. So I always turn stretch as, a, as an offensive coordinator. I'm always looking at the defensive players like I could use him. <laughs> oh, what could I do if I had him? 
what can I do if I have him? But I don't, I don't get to choose him anymore because I'm, I'm not, I don't have the the pick. But um, I was just talking to him about it. He's, he's a great young man. And if you watch, if you want to watch a highlight tape, watch his highlight tape of him on offense when he was in high school. He's an impressive dude. So. With just the talent on hand there is he on this field today. But you know, obviously, y'all weren't practicing real football yet. But yeah, close. No, there's a there there's a obviously this is a very talented football team. But I think Ryan made a point to the team, and I think our players really understand it's the non-talented things that are going to help this team win. You know, it's the discipline development that we're going to have. It's the skill development that we're going to have here during spring ball that's going to be the difference maker. Because um, there are a lot of talented teams out there. Um, yeah. one, one quick, what did Brian tell you when y'all, you know, you came up with the, uh, the final deal here that you're going to come here as obvious court? What did he tell you he wants out of you? Meaning, what, what does he expect you to bring to the table, so to speak, or what does he want better than last year? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't. We didn't really talk about the past, you know. I, and I, I've never been one to talk about the past. It was just, what's the future and what would it look like, and you know, what are the pluses of this place, you know? And I understand, um, you know, why Ohio State has been the tops in the country in recruiting because the head coach is a really good recruiter. So those conversations with the head coach from a recruiting standpoint, I can tell what a good recruiter he is. But he also has an amazing place to sell. You know, I think this, this is uh, in the short time I've been here. You know, the fan base is amazing. Um, the people that work in this building are amazing. Um, and I think the support that this football team has is amazing. So, um, you know, just highlighting those, three, those couple of things to me where, um, you know, it just seemed to fit for the timing in my life of – of where I wanted to be and, and what we wanted to do, and um, it worked out. So today was a good day. Coach, thank you very much. All right, thank thanks, Sharon. Hey, folks, I'm in big trouble. I know from a lot of you guys, but also from internally as well. we got to get out of here. they got to bring some recruits in or parents in or something in. So we got to wrap up right now. And get get out. out. Um, can't be a long one because I've already burned through a lot of the computer batteries.